That is like worship in surround sound. Woo! Good morning, all. Good morning. And welcome to Unity Church Unitarian on this fine, fine spring day. I'm Reverend Kathleen Rollenz. I'm serving as your interim senior minister and sharing today's worship service with worship associate Meryl Aldrich. I want to give a special welcome and a shout out to our visitors and guests and also to those of you who are watching us online this morning. We can't see you, but we're sending you our love and our blessings and we're so delighted that you are here with us. This morning is a special treat. We are thrilled to welcome back our guest musicians, 2911 International Exchange. Yes! They are a music ministry based in South Africa and the United States, and their mission is to facilitate hope and reconciliation through musical performance and collaboration, artistic development, and cross-cultural relationships. So uh, members of 2911, we are so delighted that you are here with us again, um, and we look forward to not only your music today, but joining you in the parish hall after the service where they also have a table and you can find more about the important ministry of 2911. So welcome, welcome once again to this time of shared worship. Welcome all to this time we make sacred through our presence to one another. I invite you to release this morning. Leave behind the stress of this past week and set aside worry about tomorrow for this hour. Come fully into this time and this place. Loosen your grip on expectation. Loosen your grip on doubt. Take a breath and make space in your heart for joy. We light this chalice as a reminder of what we can be for one another. Come, let us worship together. So all sopranos, all the sopranos in the house, let's do this voice. Here we go. You got it, sopranos? Let's do it again. One more time, sopranos. Come on, sing. If you are alto, you got to do this. Say it.
Your word is a little bit different. And your word is Jabulani. Can you say Jabulani? All the bases, whichever voice sings low, you are a bass, okay? That can be male or female. We don't, everybody can sing low. So basses, your note is Jabu, Jabu, Jabulani, Jabu, Jabu, Jabulani, Jabu, Jabu, Jabulani, Jabu, Jabu, Jabulani. You got that basses? Let me hear it. That's right. That's right. Now put all the voices together. Here we go. Here. Please remain standing <laughs> or resume standing in body or spirit. <laughs> Today's responsive reading is number 441 in the back of your gray hymnal. To worship. To worship is to stand in awe under a heaven of stars before a flower, a leaf in sunlight, or a grain of sand. To worship is to work with dedication and with skill. It is to pause from work and listen to a strain of music. Worship is a loneliness seeking communion. It is a thirsty land crying out for rain. Worship is the mystery within us, reaching out to the mystery beyond. 
Each time we gather for worship, we set aside a moment to expand the caring ministry of this congregation. And together we recognize the cycle of life and death, the circle of love, compassion, and witness that is at the center of this and every sacred community. We stand at the side of parents and teachers and all those whose primary spiritual practice is caring for children with those who live with grief or chronic pain, with illnesses seen and unseen, with mental disability or addiction. We pray for our neighbors in prison and those who care for family members who are in ill health and those who are struggling to stay afloat in the midst of poverty. We pray for those facing the end of their lives we hold in care the people of this courageous congregation as together we live into our longing to embody and to help build the beloved community. So will you pray with me now for all these we name. We celebrate the life and mourn the death of Rita Flood beloved mother of Unity members Rebecca Flood and her spouse Ruth McKenzie and Rebecca's brother Ralph. Rita died last Monday, March 20th and lived a good long life, dying at the age of 98. A memorial service will be held this Friday, March 31st at 2 p.m. in the sanctuary and will also be live streamed. We are sad to announce the death of Janine Rolf Murphy who is the beloved aunt of Alan and Heidi Burkholz and sister of their mother Mary, Mary and Rolf Burkholz. She was 94 years old and able to remain at home surrounded by the loving care of her many children and grandchildren. Kelly Loffrey and Tom Schrake are thrilled to share the news of their first grandbaby, Lola Bell Freiberg. She was born on Saturday, March 18th, and her parents, Sam Freiberg and Renee Barnett, are totally in love and settling into their new role as parents. This Friday is Trans Day of Visibility, and we hold in special care our trans siblings. And I lift up the name of one trans woman, Eden Knight, who was forced to detransition, a process which ultimately led to her suicide. May we not only support our trans siblings, but may we also continue to fight legislation which aims to restrict providing life-giving medical care for our trans children and youth. And to our Muslim siblings around the world, we say Ramadan Mubarak as they enter the holy month of Ramadan, an intense time of engaged spiritual practice of fasting and prayer. So I now invite you to speak aloud the names of those persons on your mind and heart so that we may hold them in this community of caring. Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, you know the wishes and the hopes and the dreams of our hearts. May we listen carefully to them so that we may find the courage and the strength, the resilience and the persistence to make those dreams come alive in our lives and in our world. May we fast for justice. May we demand action from our representatives. 
May we insist on human worth and dignity for all persons. May we reach out to comfort those who mourn. May we always find reason to give thanks, to steep ourselves in the spiritual practice of daily gratitude, and to lift our hands in praise for this one wild, precious life we have been given. We pause now for a moment of silence as we give witness to these aspirations. Amen. Blessed be. May it be so. special welcome to the children in the sanctuary for this story Sunday. Would you come up front and as we do, join me for the story for all ages. Lots of room up front. Come on up. Thank you especially for the music that you are bringing. Those of you who sing in the choir and in the big choir that is the sanctuary. Come on up close. We are gifted with such powerful, beautiful music Sunday after Sunday. And then added onto that, we have musical guests who are bringing special music. And we're going to do something special with 2911. But that brought me to thinking about a story. Once upon a time, as this old story goes, there was a great composer who died. He was a musical genius of his time, and all of his brilliant students started to be fiercely jealous with each other. They wanted to be the favorite of their teacher who had died. The composer was survived by his younger brother, and the younger brother saw the composer students fighting with one another. A rivalry had started, and the students trying to get any scrap of music composition that they could keep for themselves. They wanted something of their teacher just for themselves. So the younger brother had an idea. He gathered up all of the manuscripts, the written com compositions, and he stored it in a safe place. And then he chose the last composition by his brother, the composer, and he ripped it up <laughs> into tiny pieces. And he mailed out these pieces to the composer's students. When the students got this, they were horrified because they knew that this was the only copy of the last manuscript. And so some of them mounted and framed the piece that they got, put it on a wall like a holy relic. 
But after a while, they received another mailing from the younger brother inviting all of the student musicians, if you really appreciated your teacher, the composer, and if you're really missing his work, wouldn't it be great to come together to unite all the fragments of the music and perform this for the public? And the students started to chatter and discuss and murmur among themselves. And then finally, they agreed that it would be the most honorable thing to gather all the fragments so the copyist can then make copies of the final composition. And then they would put on a performance of their teacher's last composition. Publicity spread and news spread and everyone in the community and in the public were excited about this. At their first rehearsal, the students came back. They were a little awkward and a little embarrassed, but they started to rehearse. Only to discover that halfway through the music, something was wrong. There was a section, a whole section of music that was missing. Not just a couple of bars, but 32 long bars of music was absent, was missing. Indeed, in secret, one of the student musicians, a clever student, thought, I'm not going to turn my fragment in. Because if I hold on to it, it'll only increase in value. It'll become that famous missing piece of the famous composer. And maybe one day, I can sell it for lots of money. On the night of the performance, the concert, with the whole theater filled, they started to play the music. And they played beautifully, with feeling for the peace, but with deep feeling and reverence for their former teacher. And the audience could feel the power of this music. And then when they came to that missing portion, the student musicians put down their instruments, lowered and bowed their head, and then they just kept silent for 32 bars. The gathered audience was astounded. They were shocked. They didn't know what to make of it. They realized that something was missing. The music was incomplete. And they started to whisper to one another, for they all felt that that portion of the music was the emotional high point of the whole composition, in fact, of that whole evening. After the performance and the great applause, the brother went on stage and addressed the whole gathered community. We have all heard my brother's final gift to the world. And we have all in our own way felt his beautiful, brilliant presence among us tonight. But I'm sure all of us also felt an absence, a hole in the world, something that is not yet complete. And it has probably sharpened and deepened our longing to come together, to be united, to know that we are connected. After all, it is that yearning that music 
calls and draws us into something that is transcendent. This word that means being part of something bigger, greater than any one of us. May we who feel this absence and incompleteness know the power of song and music and worship And the audience applauded. And all of the competition and rivalry dissolved into music and song that night, especially as the student musicians walked home in embrace of one another. And so, we have music. So I'm going to teach you a song. Is that okay? Hmm? Is that okay? Children, I'm going to teach you a song, right? Here we go. Repeat after me. I'm going to start. Here we go. We are the drum. That's right. We are the drum. We are the drum. Africa to America. Shake it off. Shake it off. We're almost there. We're almost there. Can we do that one again? I'll, I'll call and you respond. Here we go. We are the drum. We are the drum. We are the drum. We are the drum. Africa to America. Africa to America. We are the drum. I like that. Now that we know the song, we're going to sing it together. There's no call and respond. respond. Can we start it together? Ready? We are the That's right. We are the Africa to America. We are the Everybody sing. We are the That's right. as a church six.
Your support of the church is an expression of the promises we make to each other and to the world. The larger portion of our offering will be shared with St. Joseph's Coat, a St. Paul free store serving nearly 700 people weekly by providing clothing and services. Today's collection will help St. Joseph's Coat continue to offer this essential support to a growing number of families and individuals. Will the ushers please come forward? Please give as generously as you can today. We dedicate these offerings and ourselves to the greater work of the church, which is weaving a tapestry of love we call community. The reading today comes from Reverend Gretchen Haley from the Foothills Unitarian Church, Fort Collins, Colorado. And it's one of my favorites. Every Friday night at the prison, we'd gather for worship, which I quickly learned meant gathering around a CD player blasting what a Lutheran pastor friend of mine calls Jesus is my boyfriend, music. <laughs> the music would fill the room, and the women would sing along with all their hearts raising their arms, filled with passion, swaying together, singing, Jesus, Jesus. 
As for me, well, I stood in the back, my arms firmly crossed, hoping to demonstrate to all who might look my way this was not my thing. More than just feeling personally uncomfortable, I felt embarrassed for the women and for all this cheesy, superficial theology they had somehow embraced. And from this distanced and defended place, I watched. We Unitarian Universalists are a funny people, I think, so often resisting with our brains the experiences our hearts most crave, so often talking ourselves out of the love that stands so close, we could almost eat it up if we would just stop. Let go, love. To receive love like that would mean an ongoing willingness for vulnerability, an ongoing journey of transformation, being broken open and changed, born and reborn again. On the surface, you might think this kind of path would come easily to us. We love to talk about change, after all. At least we do when it has to do with something out there, something we can theoretically direct and control and analyze. But let's be honest. When it comes to our personal lives, well, we like ourselves the way we are. We cross our arms and stand back, hoping to avoid that deep discomfort that comes when you're facing something that just might change your life. We create communities where difference is masked and discomfort is minimized. We create lives that reassure us if something needs changing, it's out there, not in here, in this messy, uncontrollable mess of the human heart. Several weeks ago, as I began working on this order of service, I started asking questions about the kind of music our fabulous guest artist, 2911, were going, was going to offer. Well, what exactly are you going to sing? And the answer I kind of heard back was, you know, we're going to figure it out. <laughs> well, what title should I put in the order of service? Should I put the words in the order of service? Eh, just leave it blank. We, might be made up in the moment, might change depending on the mood of the room. <sighs> you need to know something about my approach to worship. I rarely leave any moment in the worship service to chance. I mean, sometimes I might get a little loose up here and get spontaneous, but most of the time, everything is written down. So, when I didn't know exactly what y'all were going to sing or do, I was pretty nervous. I mean, this white girl was raised in a Missouri Synod Lutheran church. When deviating from the standard order of service could be considered a sin. Not done. So, not, and not too long after uh, getting kicked out of my confirmation class in the same Lutheran church, I started attending an evangelical Baptist church with my friend. And like the story told by my colleague, Reverend Gretchen Haley, I found myself amidst a small group of charismatic Baptists who every Sunday were raising their hands and praising Jesus, and I never did. I liked Jesus, and I eventually came to call myself a Christian and a follower of Jesus. But what they were doing, it just never felt natural to me. I felt embarrassed and intrigued all at the same time. I just wondered, what exactly were they praising? Fast forward, I started attending seminary, started studying worship for real. I studied the history of liturgy from the Latin word, the people's work. 
And during my first sabbatical, my husband and I toured the country in search of what we called transformative worship. And our research from that sabbatical resulted in the book called Worship That Works. And on that sabbatical, we experienced all kinds of worship services, from a, a single Muslim man who pulled out his prayer rug at a gas station in Denver, Colorado, to a mega church in the suburbs of Chicago, to a garage band worship in Minneapolis. And we asked ourselves deliberately naive questions. Why were these people getting together? What are they worshiping? And why do we call it a worship service? So in our research, we came across a book by Dan Kimball, who asked the same question. I'm going to uh, offer you this quote from the book. He writes this. He says, we usually call the weekend time when a church family gets together a worship service. Now, ironically, this term used to mean a time when the saints of God all meet to offer their service to God through worship and their service to others in the church. Over time, however, the title has slowly reversed. The weekend worship service has become the time of week when we go to a church building, much like a car goes to an automobile service station. Mm. He continues, most people view the weekend worship service as a place where we go to get service done to us by getting our tanks filled up at the service station. It's a place where someone will give us service, a sermon, and give us weekly sustenance. In automobile terms, you could say it is our weekly fill-up. We come to our service station to have a song leader service by singing songs, all so we can feel good when we emotionally connect through singing and feel secure that we did worship. End quote. Now, later on in the article, Kimball acknowledges his sarcasm with this service station analogy. But I got to say, you know, on the one hand, it's certainly true. We come to worship for a weekly fill-up. We come to pray, to meditate, to sing. We come to hear ancient words in scripture and contemporary poetry. We come to hold one another in prayer. We gather to hear our fellow church members offer their service in music, in, as worship associate, as bell ringers, and so much more. So it's not only about being filled up. It is indeed offering our service, our lives, our prayers, our finances, our talents, in service to one another in church. So I think most of us can agree with this dual task of worship, to both be served and to serve. But what's harder to agree on is how we do it. Some of us, for example, believe the way to begin a worship service is in silence. Quiet, meditative music that plays as people enter, creating a silent space for our, our hearts and our minds to settle. Others don't want to come into the worship service until the music starts because they want to step into the stream of the service that's already moving. And likewise, at the end of the service, for the last 20 some odd years, you were used to sitting through the postlude and not leaving until the last note of that postlude had been sounded. And then just a couple of weeks ago, Ahmed and I said, you know, you can leave if you wish. And if there's something other than the piano music, we'll ask you to sit and listen. Ooh, boy, did we hear about that one. <laughs> Ooh, let me tell you. So as part of my work as your interim minister, I told you I wanted to experiment with your worship service a bit. Why? <laughs> well, remember a couple weeks ago when the opening words of our worship included something about comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable? Yeah, it felt to me like worship had gotten a little too comfortable, particularly from a white, Protestant, introverted perspective. Where, I wondered, were the overt expressions of juice and joy? What about those, who might, those of us who might want to lift up our hands in praise and shout hallelujah without embarrassment? <laughs> 
could, over the course of several weeks, could our worship services contain intellectual stimulation, emotional gravitas, deep silence, spiritual moments of transcendence, embodied joy, and yes, moments of sheer yippee. <laughs> I struggled with how to express all this until I got an email reflecting on these worship changes from one of you. And we were talking about the worship changes to the service. He had some thoughts um, about moving the announcements in the offertory to after the sermon on most Sundays. But in a later reflection, he wrote this, quote, one way to explore new worship possibilities might be through the language, through the lens of worship languages. What would it mean for us to be multilingual lingual with respect to the languages of worship? For example, we might think about the worship language of silence as well as festivity and joyous exuberance. The worship language of beauty both musical and visual, of bold prophetic proclamation and at times of tender intimacy, end quote. So this is one of the reasons why I love you as a congregation. You care deeply about your worship life and you let your ministers know that. And in this case, this member gave me the metaphor for what we're trying to do here, to expand our worship language so that on any given Sunday, we can speak or sing or sign or embody the worship arts using all of our senses, not just our heads, not just our hearts, but all of them. You may love the silence before the service begins. But someone else may need a jolt of spiritual rock and roll to engage their body. You may cherish hearing the exact same words spoken in the embracing meditation. But your neighbor has tuned out and is checking their phones because they've heard it hundreds of times over the years. You see, this mutual experience of ours is an act of service to each other by acknowledging that worship needs differ from person to person. And that's why our worship service, though following a standard format, admittedly a Protestant style format, adapts and shifts and change actually Sunday to Sunday as well as over the years. And when your new minister arrives in August of 2024, at a certain point, they will want to adapt and amend the worship service as well. Mindfully, respectfully, respectful of your traditions, but it's co-created between minister and congregation. Our worship life is a living tradition. It reflects historical roots while being open to innovation. And there's one big innovation that, as your interim minister, I haven't even touched. Now, fortunately, this came from the same church member who suggested we consider ourselves being multilingual practitioners of the worship arts. And here's what he wrote. i got to take a sip for this one. He said, quote, A fun interim task for you... <laughs> might be to take the flack for easing the congregation into the late 20th century by figuring out how to place video screens tastefully and acceptably in the sanctuary. I knew that would get a rise out of you. I knew it. I, I knew it. About 20 years ago, he says, I had 20 years ago, I attended a large middle-of-the-road Lutheran church in Minneapolis that had them. The sermon was something about anti-racism, although they wouldn't have used that word at the time. The minister began his sermon with a three-minute news clip, which set the scene in a way no words ever could. I realized then that if one wanted to bring the world into the hearts and minds of the congregation, there was no substitute for that video. It could be especially helpful, 
useful for helping a largely white congregation work towards fulfilling its ends statements. I want you to note the phrase, easing the congregation into the late 20th century. <laughs> Unitarian Universalists used to be on the cutting edge of worship, but we have long been surpassed by those who have as rich a liturgical tradition as we do. So the use of screens and video is so commonplace now that I sometimes forget that we don't have them here. I have now served four congregations since writing Worship That Works. All of them initially freaked out at the thought of putting video screens in their worship service. All of them did it. And all of them use them now tastefully, acceptably, artistically, and powerfully to enhance their worship. So all I'm saying here <laughs> is that worship changes, as do we, but there are some things that will never change because those things are embedded in the human spirit long before we could even articulate what that thing was. It is, as Jacob Trapp said, an inarticulate silence yearning to speak. It is the window of the moment open to the sky of the eternal. And there are many ways and means by which we open that window and experience the sky. Yet within each heart and soul, there exists this impulse to be lifted up and out of the ordinary, even if for a moment, to feel more deeply those things which we scant notice when on our daily round, to experience the holy in the presence of community, those things will not change. Whether we are lifted up by a phrase of music or an image or a poem or a video clip on a screen or stepping into the infinite pool of silence, these shall be ours and for those who come after us, creating those opportunities for each other. That is what it means to be in service to worship. May it be so. As I just said in the sermon, an important part of our worship life is service, and there are many opportunities for you to connect with others, to grow in wisdom and compassion, and to serve needs greater than your own. And here are some of those opportunities I wanted to draw to your attention. This is especially for visitors and guests, but all are welcome to attend the Finding Yourself at Unity program. It's held every Sunday in the Gannett Room at 1015. Today, the focus is Membership 101. Also wanted to acknowledge today is the last day to paint murals with Unity's residence artist and residence, Gino Okok. And you can join Gino on the lower level from 1215 to 3. No artistic skills are needed. Just come. Uh, this Wednesday, Wellspring Wednesday features two special programs in addition to um, some of the regular programs. One is sponsored by Unity's Act for Earth team, and it's uh, to learn about pollinator gardens uh, with Barbara Porwit. And the second program includes a discussion about the End of Life Options Act, which is a bill before the Minnesota legislator. Dr. Rebecca Toman will review the bill and invite participants to consider what their end of life preferences might be when their time comes. So some important programs this Wednesday. And then finally, speaking of service, this is a gentle reminder that March is Minnesota Food Share Month, and our food pantry, our baskets are getting pretty low. So please consider bringing some of the food items that are listed in your This Week at Unity um, to replenish our offering. And with that, we're going to invite 2911 back to teach us another closing hymn. We don't need any words in the order of service, right? <laughs> no, we're just going to do it. The way
word I'm looking for is Jabulani, again. Now, not just the basses, but everybody is gonna sing it, okay? Jabulani. So when I point at you, you say? Jabulani. But there's no swimming, so find the note, okay? <laughs> easy, easy. Shake it out, you look a little tense. <laughs> What Jabulani means, and you need to celebrate to be happy. 
you shout to sing to them. That is Jabulani. Thank you. That was our benediction, but if you have found joy in this service, take it with you so that you may share this full-bodied amen with the world. Go in peace this day and go in joy. Amen. Party, 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 party